will be done for the summer at that point. So basically up through VBS or whatever. So two, weeks. two weeks? Dang it. It was wishful thinking. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> nope, nope. Well, we won't even, hopefully Genesis chapter 2, I don't know, <laughs> we'll see. Somebody, there, it is so difficult to explain to people outside of this room how we've yet to get out of Genesis 1 without, with people still showing up, so. I know, well, hey, we're going we're gonna to be all throughout it again. This is, it gets confusing. We're going to be all throughout the Bible again. So that's how this is going to work as far as this goes. Because it sets up. That's what's important. I know we have a couple of new guests and new, new faces in here. What my goal is, is to help you see that these things that are written in Scripture are incredibly intentional, are incredibly on purpose, and when studied with the right eyes and mind, demand anything but divine authorship. In other words, God had to be all in these pages and my hope is that by re recapturing some of the methodologies that the authors are writing and some of the, the, the importance of what they're writing, you'll begin to take that and then put that into your other studies that you do throughout Scripture, and, you, and those things will begin to appear. Jesus spoke, his most often type of teaching was parables, and parables were usually a kind of hidden teaching. It forced the reader to not just take a surface level approach if they wanted to get some meat out of it, but to begin to seek and search and to, the way Psalm 1 would put it, to meditate on this word day and night for a lifetime. And in doing so, that's where you, that's where you, find, that's where you find God in, in every single word and page. And, uh, and so, unfortunately, for a long period of time, we've developed some really bad habits and very, I don't know, lessened views of what Scripture is, and it's become sort of reference manuals or self-help books and that kind of thing, or theological arguing points or whatever it may be. But my goal is to really just look and see, try to rediscover what it, what it is from the point of view of an ancient Israelite. And so we are in Genesis 1. For, for, for the first couple of minutes, I'd just like to open up because we've had a couple weeks. If there are things that you want to, that have stood out to you that you would like to say this is something you've learned or something that maybe you've had questions about or you want clarifications or you feel is important going forward to keep in the back of our mind. So just open up a couple of minutes and if you have something that comes to mind, we can talk about that. I just think it's, I think it's it's really interesting that you've gone well, one week we were in Genesis and mm-hmm. we went all the way to Revelation even mm-hmm. so all that we went through the entire Bible and all of it is basically referenced back in Yes I, I am of the I am of the belief or I have the conviction that this is one cohesive story from page 1 to the end and it's all interconnected, and it all is intentionally done so in a way to teach and, and develop what, what God, who God is. And it's not just a bunch of random stories that are just trying to get us to read or make ourselves better people. So, yeah, we're going to do the same similarly tonight. Anything else? Well, I like how you said this morning as far as his repetition. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I did throw a right hand turn in there. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of repetitions, a lot of things that, that cause and force your eyes to just glaze over. And when you do that by nature, it, then you miss the fun stuff. But if you can battle that and know that they're doing that on purpose, trying to almost get you to glaze over, that's where you start to see the little things. For instance, a couple of weeks ago, our last time we got together, do you remember what the main subject point was, what we kind of talked about? A long time ago. The chaos. And the... Mm-hmm. Oh, the tanin. The tanin, yeah, the chaos. The chaos beast of the waters that God created, and He created not, He didn't just fill the, the waters with the fish and teeming fish, but He created this great and mysterious sea creature. And that's the thing that we took, and it will be an image that will be used over and over and over again in a way throughout all of Scripture to help us understand that this chaos monster wants to rule and reign and destroy the earth, and, but God, He treats it like it's a play toy. He gives it the waters to, to play in. It like, makes like what's happening today in the real world, but going on is like good and evil or yeah. however you want to look at it, but it's, you know, I mean, 
it's happening here and it's still happening now. Yeah. So. Yep. It's just kind of kind of weird how it kind of fits in. Yep. And I said this a couple of weeks ago, I'm not really interested in, in the arguing, arguing whether or not this is 24 literal or seven literal 24 hour days or seven periods of time. I actually think that in, this works in both of those ways at the same time. And I'm also not arguing that this is a chronological historical approach towards how things were created, but I think that I'm okay with people for sure believing that. I believe that he probably created everything in seven literal days, but I'm not gonna argue that because I don't think that's the point. I think the point is much, much deeper and, and larger than that, than that. So that is something that a lot of people will get you know, tripped up on, and I, I don't want to do that. So well, believe what you will. You've made the reference that the earth is going back, it's trying to get back to decay, and it looks like that's happening more exponential every day. We, it goes by. The decay is happening faster and faster and faster. Mm -hmm. worse. Yeah. Yeah, because that's what that's what it has to happen, and and actually we'll we'll tie into that a little bit tonight as well, and some yeah, anything else? Any other questions or thoughts before we continue on? Okay, we are going to move past the filling of the waters and the skies, and we are going to move into the first hands-on part of creation, which will be the man, the man. And so, if you are in Genesis chapter one. We are going to look at, starting at verse 26, and it says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Okay, I want to stop there. I know, I know, I know, I know, I'm sorry. Okay, so what if, what, what, recall your years and years of wisdom and teachings on the scripture and reading this. What, what does this mean? What, 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 does this, what does this mean to you? Okay. Yeah, so you get the let us make man. So how many in here have heard that's the Trinity? Yeah, I've heard that my whole life. I, I'm not convinced that this is it. The reason being is what that is doing is reading an old, a New Testament understanding back into an Old Testament writing. In fact, most Hebrew script, or all, not most, all Hebrew scriptures do not believe the ancient Israelites during the time would have a triune God understanding, but they would have a, a two-part God understanding, which we can get into at a totally different time. That's another rabbit hole we'll get in. But what I do believe is happening is he's giving us a peek into his creative prop, prop, processes with beings that we have discovered he created earlier in this particular chapter, right? He created something that would represent these heavenly beings earlier in the chapter, which was the stars and the moon, and he gave them to rule the skies. And these, we went down that rabbit hole a little bit, are kind of his divine counsel, the partners through which he would have up in the heavenly realms, and now he's going to create the, what I will say, for a lack of better words, the younger brother of all creation, mankind. And I think that's important to keep in mind because that will begin to make sense as we tie these themes in throughout all of Scripture. Think about the younger brother motif of God will elevate up the younger one. God will favor the younger one over the older one. The older one will be jealous. This is that idea where there seems to be multiple layers of stories that seem to happen in these themes and patterns. And so he's created these heavenly beings that he partners with up in the sky heaven now we have to go to the second part, the, the earth heaven, or the earth in creation, and he's going to create man. How does he create them? What, does he, what, what word does he give for us as he creates man? Huh? Okay, he's going to make us, but after what? His own image. His own image. Okay, so what does that mean? And likeness. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, and, and they get that a little bit further in verse 27. This is a, a very popular view as far as that goes. God creates them in his image, and then again at the end of it, it says he created them male and female, which there, this is where we get this idea that maybe we kind of look like them, maybe we, you know, resemble a God, maybe God is somehow humanoid in, in a way. But, attributes. huh? Okay, like attributes, okay. Yep, attributes, yeah. So how could we, using the lovely Step Bible, how could we discover, like, if we went down the rabbit hole of image, what could we do to go down the rabbit hole of image on the Step Bible? 
How can we learn whether or not this is meant to be a, is, does he mean this as he made us humanoid, like to look like God? Okay, if we go to Genesis chapter 1 on Step Bible and we go down to the image here, we can click on the image. <coughs> and if we click on image, I know you can't see it up there, but it is this awesome word, which is just fun to say. Everybody say, Tselem. T-S is the sound is a sound of a Hebrew word or Hebrew letter, Selim, right? Selim is the word. This is imi- the image. If we were to click on likeness, because it's another important, it's demote. That's a little easier to say. Now, if you, if you are on Step Bible and you click on Selim, you can click on that. It's got a little 34 times button. You can click that 34 times button, and it'll pull up all 34 times just to the left here. And what's that? Livestock. Oh, yeah. on Selim. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. So if I go back to Genesis chapter one, and I click and I look at, if it'll go back. Come on, come on, internet. You can do it. If this is this is actually a good, that's a good point. If you were to highlight over this, if we were back at Genesis one, you'll notice that image, birds, fish, every image, image, likeness, image, livestock, all are all highlighted. What this means is that, remember, that Hebrew letters start with a three-letter consonant. Vowels weren't added till much later, so all words were usually built off of a two- to three-letter consonant. They determined what these words would mean based off of the context of when they were reading it later, so they would read this and they would read these ideas, but what you need to understand is these three letters can be now used, like in an instance, if I just made it Salim, Salim, something like that, This will mean a totally different word. I don't know what it is. I just made it up. But but you have to keep this in mind because these two words are connected because they have the same exact root, and that's how it was originally written. So you have to keep that in mind. So this is a good example. If I were to click on, for instance, I'm on image now. If I were to click on fish, if anybody gets it before I do, the daga, okay? Undefined hope, not sure what that one is. If I were to click on livestock, none of these are working for me. Animal behema. Well, there's a good there's a good example. Behema for animal. This what does that sound like to you? The behema. Behemoth. Yeah, right. Big. Right. Behema is also the same as this is an animal, this is a beast, the behemoth, which is we talked about last week related to the Leviathan related to the sea creatures. It's this idea of the great beast, the big beast. So that's a good example here. My internet's not going to work enough for me to be able to do that. But if I looked up the Tselem and I started to go down here, you would, you'll, see the, you'll see man in Genesis chapter 9 is used for it, as well as his own image. In Numbers chapter 33, let's read Numbers 33 verse 52. It says this, Then you shall, he's speaking to the Canaan, or to the Israelites while they're going into the land of Canaan. Then you shall drive out all of the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their figured stones, destroy all their metal images, and demolish all their high places. What are they talking about? Yeah, yeah, the idols, right? The idols. You are to go in and destroy all of these idols. Okay, so let's just keep going down here a little bit. Let's go to to 2 Kings chapter 11, verse 18. It says, Then all the people of the land went to the house of Baal, or Baal, if you're Texan, and tore it down. (laughs) His altars, his images, they broke into pieces, and they killed Matan, the priest of Baal, before the altars. And the priest posted watchmen over the house of the Lord. So this image is here. What are we talking about? An idol, right? If you keep going, there's just two out out of a plethora of them. If you keep going down, what you'll start to see is this word image literally is actual, the literal translation for an idol. So now place that back into Genesis chapter one. God would create us after his own idol, his own statue, his own representation of a deity in creation. After his own likeness, if you go down that same, that same path with the likeness, the demut, We're going to get after his likeness, again, father to son after his own likeness, okay? We get to, in 2 Kings, King Ahaz went to Damascus to meet 
Pelezer, the king of Assyria. He saw an altar that was at Damascus, and King Ahaz sent Uriah, the priest, a model of the altar, an image, a likeness, a figurine, basically, of the altar, a figure of the altar. Second Chronicles, under it were figures of gourds for ten cubits, compassing, encompassing all the sea around. Anyways, you keep going down this. We got likeness, we got likeness, we got likeness. Most of the time, the likeness here is going to be in the situation of either beast or living creatures, likeness. And these words used in conjunction as far as image, the tselem, and the likeness, the demut, is always used in the sense of tearing down high altars, tearing down statues of the deities within the area. That's important because that, to me, changes slightly the meaning of what after his own likeness and image looks like in Genesis chapter 1. It's not that God is humanoid, although he is, he manifests in a humanoid way multiple times throughout Scripture, but the meaning here is that God would create us as an image, as an idol of God within this earth. Now, why would that feel weird a little bit later on in, in, in the book of Exodus? What, what are we told in the book of Exodus about idols? Yeah, yeah. Exodus chapter, chapter 20, right? Exodus 20, very number one, right? Have no other gods, don't. And then number two, don't have any idols. Don't graven images. Don't create a, a physical representation of these other gods or of God, Yahweh himself. Why? He is a jealous God. He is a jealous God. going to end up replacing real God because I can physically look at and see. Yeah. So therefore, that's my idol. Right. Be careful of that. Sonic dream. And why is that funny if you look at that through the lens of Genesis chapter 1? If I were to create, I don't have that out here. I created an idol of Yahweh. This is the God of the Israelites, Yahweh. We will look at him, we will look at this, and we will worship it knowing it is a physical embodied representation of God, Yahweh, on earth. Why would this be funny to God read through the lens of Genesis chapter 1? Really? You think he can put me down into something that small? Okay, I'm good with that. That's Yep, I, I think that's good too. Well, Exodus didn't happen yet. They didn't talk about the... The rest of the, I don't even know what it. Yeah, I see what you're saying, but that's not quite my question. What did you say, Lauren? He was saying that we're like idols. Yes, we don't make one because we are them. We are the physical embodied representation of God Yahweh on earth. And for us to make this is to belittle not only God, but belittle us too. We are his image. People are to look at us and worship God. Now, to prove that point, and to, let's step back into the ancient Israelites or the ancient times, right? So I've got a couple things here. This is not an uncommon usage of words. In the surrounding nations back in ancient Israel, we had like Assyrians, the Babylonians, we had the Egyptians. And I've got a couple of, of pictures here. What this is, is this is an actual statue. And on this statue, I know you can't see this, but there, are, uh, there is writing on here. And this is a statue of the Syrian king, King Hadad E.T. in the 9th century BC. It's dedicated to Adad, which is, the, which is a, a Syrian name for Baal, the patron storm god of Syria. And it's described precisely in the language of Genesis 1, 126. The statue of the king represents Adad's, the king, the god's authority, which Hadad E.T. embodies and represents. So what you see, physical statue of a human being, this human being is the representation of a deity, Baal. His own appearance is the representation of the deity, Baal. To Adad, this is reading this writing here, it says, the, likened, the likeness of Hadad CE, which he placed before Hadad, controller of water in heaven and earth. So in other words, the likeness of this God was placed before this human, was placed within this human to represent the, the God Baal. The image, again, reading down here, the image is for establish, establishing his throne so that his utterance may please the gods. In other words, whatever this king would do, he has authority to do over all people because the God gave him his image 
over the people. So this, God, this human king, this human ruler, now can use the image and the likeness of Baal to rule and to, to, to bring down authority onto human people. And this is not an un, uncommon event across all of Scripture, even all the way up till Jesus' time. How many rulers do you know claim to be descendants of the gods or empowered by the gods that they worshipped? Many, many, many. This is just one example. Here's, here's another one. This is the statue of, I'm not even going to try to say it. You want to try it? You want to try it? Yeah. The third. <laughs> That's him right here. He is a, an Egyptian pharaoh. He's beside the deity right here who appoints him as a divine image and representative. So this pharaoh is appointed in the likeness and image of this deity through which the Egyptians would, would, would worship. Here's another, another one. The Egyptian royal ideology. This is their ideology based off of what they believed about pharaohs. The pharaohs were called the image of Re or Ra, the sun deity, the chief of the Egyptian pantheon. This is a picture right here. No, this isn't. That's not a pharaoh. This is a Babylonian. I don't know what that is. Ignore that. Pharaoh Ahamos, who was called the prince of Re, the child of Keb, his heir, the image of Re, whom he created, the representative for whom he has set himself on earth. You can take a picture of this or read this wherever you want. But ultimately, what, we're, what I'm saying is this is, a, this is normal language. This is everyday language back then. The deity would make a ruler, a human king, in, in his image after their own likeness. And that likeness and image would then be used to authoritatively rule the people. Authoritatively. Now, this would stand out when reading Genesis chapter 1. Because what you see is you see the image is now instilled into humans. But which one? Is it? Does it say Adam? Which human? All of them. And where all have the image and likeness of the God, who holds the power? Yeah. Everybody. Everybody. Anybody. Right? Now read that back into this context. Go back to Genesis chapter 1, 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion, rule over all of the fish of the sea, over all the birds of the heaven, over the livestock, over the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Man is created after this deity, but he's to rule just like any other nation, but not each other. They are to rule the beasts the created beings in this realm. <coughs> Does that make sense? This is not uncommon. This is, this is a theme that will take place over and over again. And what we see is as we move along, we get into Genesis chapter 2. Now we're going to see a two-part version of this because every time an image or an idol would be set up, where would an image and an idol in other cultures be set up? What, what place, what location would they usually be set up? Yeah, yeah, over a temple, a high place, wherever an altar is, right? A high place, an altar, E-R-A-R. E, I never remember. There we go. That works. <laughs> right. Now think about, think about later on when they, when Israelites also establish a temple, a tabernacle, right? In the middle of the tabernacle is the Holy of Holies. What is located within the middle of the tabernacle and the Holy of Holies? Do you remember? Yeah. What? Yep. Uh-huh. Do what? The, yep, the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant, which has these cool little beings. I'm gonna, I don't even want to pretend to draw those, right? They got wings, right? So there's two angels, angelic beings on top of the altar, right? Who could go into the Holy of Holies? Yeah, one guy. One priest could step foot into the Holy of Holies where they would see a throne, a seat, a throne, an altar, which is representative of a throne. But right here in the middle, conspicuously, there's nothing. It's, there's nothing. There's nothing in the middle of it. There's two angels on either side. There's nothing in the middle of it. Why? Where are the idols? They are placed in altars. We are the idols. So figuratively, this throne would be for us. There's a problem, though. We can't get to that throne. Only one guy can, right? Only one guy, and that one guy is a priest. 
So right now we have both, we were made in his image to be kings, rulers, and the only ones who ultimately can even begin to do that have to be priests. Keep that in the back of your mind, kings and priests. That should sound familiar. And so what we're going to see now is we skip into the garden, which we'll, we'll get into much later, but the garden, we see the man. Suddenly, we no longer see Adam, which is mankind, man. Now we're going to see the man, Ha-Adam. And the man, alongside woman, will be in the presence of God, right? Called to bring order out of chaos. But there's a problem. There will be a creature. What's that creature? <laughs> yes, the t I like the Tanin. Yeah, the, the, the Nakash, the serpent. Oh, yeah. The Nakash, the serpent, will be will have multiple meanings to it. We'll get into much later. But what we're going to see is are they, it, what part of realm is the Nakash or the serpent supposed to be? Who is supposed to have dominion over the serpent? Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, over the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Right. Man is supposed to be king of the Nakash, the serpent. And what do we see? Does he rule the serpent? No. The serpent tricks him. It leads to death, exile, nakedness. Right? Skip forward one more, one, one more story to their next generation. Maybe they will be the kings and the priests that we need. Right? Cain and Abel. Cain, why are you so upset that God have chose the younger brother's offering over yours? Don't you know if you continue to do well, it'll be fine. You'll be elevated. You'll be lifted up. But if not, there's this thing, this pesky thing back here, sin. It's crouching at the door. What does that sound like? Does it sound like a king or a priest or a beast? Oh, that rhymes. I like that. A king, priest, or beast. I'm going to put it down here. I'll make a rap for you. Adam. Thank you, ma'am. Please do. So king, priest, or beast. Problem is, Cain chooses to rule the beast or allow the beast to rule him. And it leads to death. Yes, destruction, chaos, right? Skip forward. This is imagery that we're going to see on replay over and over until you get to one book in the Old Testament, particularly that's going to take all this imagery that we've been studying and just hit it all at once, right? Turn with me to Daniel, your second favorite book, your first favorite book. <laughs> Daniel. So now, what happens while still in Eden, God is going to speak to his, his rulers on earth who have now failed, and he's going to say, look, there's going to be the seed of a woman one day who will crush the serpent. But until then, the serpent will have offspring too. He'll have his own seed. That seed will be in battle with the seed of the woman forever and ever or for a long, long period of time until one day there will be one seed of a woman who will come and crush the beast. Daniel chapter 1, what we're going to see much later on in scripture is now we are taken out of the promised land. We've been exiled out from the promised land of God. Think Eden out of Eden where, you know what, some young, youthful, good-looking, smart, wise guys, wise young men are going to be pulled there. Daniel chapter 1, we'll just go there. Verse 1, in the third year, in the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hands with some of the vessels, right here, some of the vessels, of the house of God. He brought them to the land of Shinar, the house of his God. So now we have parts of the temple that are in uh, the wrong temple with the wrong place, right? In the, into the treasury of his God. And he's going to pull these guys that just so happen to be young, strapping, beautiful, without blemish, blameless. And they're going to go through a test, a test that involves choosing food or not. Can you see how this sounds familiar? We've got the young strapping, look, good-looking, wise individual being tested with food. Right, absolutely. And so we have Daniel who will ultimately say, I'm not going to overcome, I'm not going to allow those laws that they had in Leviticus as far as kosher, eating kosher to, to affect them. So they're going to only eat vegetables. And it says at the end of a certain period of time, where they did not defile themselves with that food, they became better in appearance, fatter in flesh. This is verse 15. They, were, they became more humanly humans the way that it was supposed to be when tempted. They overcome, they rule this, this, this ruler who seems to be ruling the world right now. 
and God elevates them up. In verse 20, in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them all 10 times better. Then chapter two, we're going to get this, this dream. Nebuchadnezzar is going to have a dream. And you know what the dream is about? Oh, there's this giant image. It's really, really giant image. I mean, it's made of like, just pretend like this. this is, he's got arms, hands, right? Feet. They're made of different, oh man, I'm doing this really bad. They're, look at that. Look, look, no, there you go. There's King, he's got his curly hair too. Nebuchadnezzar with his curly hair. It's this giant image. He has this dream and it's made of a bunch of stones and rocks and, or, or, or stones and precious metals and it's beautiful and it's amazing and he freaks out because he can't figure out what this dream means, right? And then Daniel's going to come and interpret the dream. He's going to say, you know what this is? This is kingdoms. These are things that you built up, but you know what? An uncut stone, you know, unpolished stone will be destroyed. It'll turn into a mountain. I think mountain of God. It'll, it'll be this whole thing. So Nebuchadnezzar chapter three, skipping ahead, he's going to have a wonderful, a wonderful response to this. What's his response? Well, hold on. Let's, I don't want to skip this real quick. I, I missed this. Daniel chapter two. What does it say when he, when Daniel interprets the dream, verse 46. I'm having a hard time not going over the details on this one. I know, right? <laughs> Rack, Shack, and Benny. Okay, so Daniel chapter 2, verse 46. Then after he, after, this is after Daniel interprets the dream, which basically tells him not nothing good, actually, but it's okay. King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to who? He worshiped Daniel. And commanded that offerings and incense be offered up to him. The king answered and said, Truly, your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. My question is, was, is this sinful? I also don't have an answer, so don't. <laughs> but what you're seeing is we've watched Eden unfold. Man is choosing to rule what we will discover soon, the literal beast that's ruling the world. Daniel chose to rule him, rule that sin, rule that beast. And in doing so, he's elevated up and the king of this world is paying homage and worshiping the image of God. Can you see how it's just an inversion of like, oh, we're getting this little tiny peek of like, oh, this is the way it's supposed to be. Let's find out if it continues. Next chapter, Nebuchadnezzar builds a huge golden image. You just read that. That was a bad idea. Why did you just now do it physically? Like, you, are you crazy? Well, he can't, get, he can't get over it, right? And anybody who doesn't bow down and worship this image, this giant idol that represents who? The man king, right? The human king, Nebuchadnezzar. They will then be thrown to the fiery furnace, right? There's your rack shack and Benny, right? <laughs> and what you see is, you know, there these they ref, the men refuse to bow to the image of this ruling king that will represent a beast, which we'll discover here soon. The re, again, verse chapter four, we're going to see that Nebuchadnezzar, after seeing this whole thing unfold. And then just to quote Veggie Tales, boss, how many guys did we throw into the flames? I think three. Why? Because there's a fourth one and he's real shiny. I know. I'm all about them Veggie Tales. You got it. You can pay me later for that one. <laughs> he, he sees the angel of the Lord. They walk through the flames. They're born new. And King Nebuchadnezzar repeats what he does before. Chapter four, he worships the God of Rakshak and Benny, right? Now he's going to have another dream. And this dream is not going to be great either. He's going to dream of this. Oh, this is where it just gets so funny. Anybody remember what he dreams of? What's he dream of? Nope, not yet. Not yet. Yeah, I heard it. Somebody say it. Oh, there's this great tree. Right? Good job. Thanks. There's a beautiful tree. This tree is massive. This tree is incredible. Its tips are all the way up into heaven. What are we thinking? The, the yeah. Okay, yes, but also think more literally, like before that. Tree. The, the garden. The yes, tree the tree of, yes, the tree of life, right? So here it is, man, 
the ruler of the world. Oh, he's established for himself his own tree. Tree of life. This thing is amazing, right? Daniel is going to interpret this dream, and for summary purposes, he's going to say, look, this is... <laughs> This is just, if you, if you don't humble yourself, like this thing is going to be torn down and you are going to be, you're going to become the beast. And what does he do? He, he's given one year. One year later, he stands up on top of his palace and he looks out and mid-sentence he's like, look at all this amazing stuff that I have built on this earth. And then boom, he, go, he, turn, he goes crazy and he becomes literally a human beast in the field. And you're watching how these writers and these authors are just playing with all of these things. What happens when the beast is ruling the world and you aren't ruling that beast? Well, it's always death, destruction, man-made versions of Eden, taking advantage of people, nakedness oftentimes, unfortunately. There's a lot of nakedness in the Bible, okay? There's a lot of it. But meanwhile, you're left going, well, who made a tree? <laughs> you can't make a tree. Like... You know, you can build an all, you can build a huge image, but an uncut stone from outer space is going to come in and, poof, and then it'll turn into a mountain and that will become a kingdom. And you're going, what in the world? We are in an upside down world here. And what happens? He humbles himself. God restores King Nebuchadnezzar. Now let's see what happens when the next generation is offered the same. And you're hearing Cain and Abel yet again. And what does he do? The next generation of King Nebuchadnezzar? offered the same, humble yourself before God. You've had proof text after proof text of it. He doesn't do so, and he's killed. And you're going, oh, that was weird. And then it gets weirder, because now Daniel's going to start giving us his dreams. What are his dreams about? Well, that, that's part of the next generation one. But what are, what are Daniel's dreams about? You know what I saw coming up out of the sea? There were a bunch of beasts. These beasts, they're pretty big deals. In fact, these beasts are going to represent kingdoms. These kingdoms are going to rule a certain amount of time, and then there'll be one beast that seems to be like a super mega beast. This guy's going to have a lot of ruling. It's going to have a lot of power. I wonder if that's going to be played with in Revelation, something that has yet to even happen. What happens when these beasts are ruling the world. You have an option. We have an option to bow and worship the beast or to represent and be the image of God ruling the beast, both physically, literally, metaphorically, symbol symbolically, in every single way. I'm making up my own words. In every way. <laughs> right? But right in the midst of this, right? Right in the midst of this terrifying little dream, <coughs> we're given this awesome vision that Daniel's going to go. So Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, it'll say, In the first, first year of Belshazzar, not to be confused with his, his name, Belteshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions in his head while he laid in bed. And he wrote them down. And he told the sum of the matter, Daniel declared, I saw my vision at night, and behold, there were four winds of the heavens stirring the great sea. Four winds stirring the sea. Sounds familiar, right? The Spirit. The Spirit of God hovering over the waters. All, just, all of it is just such reused imagery, repurposed, re, re shown. The And the four great beasts that came up out of the sea, different one of them. The first was like a lion, had eagle's wings. Then it looked, and the wings had been plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand in two, on two feet like a man, and the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast stood second like a bear. Skip down now to verse 9. As I looked, behold, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing, oh, it was white as snow. His hair of his head was pure as wool. His throne were fiery flames. A stream of fire was issued and came out from before him. Thousands upon thousands of his divine counsel here ser served him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. A court sat in judgment and the books were opened. Who is this? This would be God and he is doing what? The book of he is judging. And who holds authority to judge? A king, right? And, yeah, and yes, Jesus. We'll get to the Jesus part. You're good. You're almost, I'll tell you when. Verse 11. 
I looked, and because of the sound of the great words that, that the horn was speaking, and as I looked, the beast was killed. The body was destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. So there's this beast figure. He stands before the Ancient of the Days. Ancient Days judges him, kills this beast. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, and their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. So there's still beasts that seem to be ruling. Then I saw, verse 13, in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man. Who is this, Isis? Jesus. <laughs> and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is one that's everlasting. This doesn't say Jesus. This doesn't say God. This declares that he sees a son of Adam, a son of man. Is this a divine individual or is this a human individual? It's a trick question. <laughs> yes, it's both because we know it's Jesus. But reading this in ancient eyes, we see son of man. We think, oh, it's a human one. The seed of a, of a man <coughs> is going to stand before God and God is going to give him Authority, dominion, a kingdom, an everlasting kingdom, right? And who is destroyed because of this God and because of this Son of Man? Yeah, the, the serpent is what we'll get. Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26. And we're almost done. Matthew 26, Jesus is on trial. Jesus is on trial. Jesus is on trial. <clears throat> Jesus is on trial with a certain individual. We're going to read 63 and 64. He is on trial with a certain individual. Anybody know who this individual is? Who he's speaking to? The high priest. Okay. The high priest is the highest of the priestly orders. He's the one who can come into the presence here. He is the idol, the image of God in human form, right? He is going to be speaking to Jesus, and he says in verse 62, no, verse 61, and said, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days, verse 62. And the high priest stood up and said, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus, oh, he remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ. The Christ is the word, is a word that is not a, like a last name. Anybody know what it means? It's a title, but the Christ literally means the anointed one, the Messiah. The Messiah, it's the word that we get Messiah from. It means the anointed one. Are you, tell us, are you the anointed one? There are two people in all, or two types of people in all of scripture that are considered the anointed ones. Any guesses what those two are? Nope. Well, yes. There are two types of people who are anointed. The priests and kings. They're the only individuals in all of Scripture that are anointed. Are you the Messiah, the Mashiach? What does Jesus say? Well, you said it. <laughs> I love it. Jesus said to him, verse 64, you've said so. But I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. He quotes Daniel. He quotes Daniel chapter 7. And suddenly what you're seeing is the convergence of all of these themes, all of these passages where man was meant to come and be God, be reflections, be the idols, be the, the literal representatives of God in earth to rule and have dominion over all of the beasts. But the problem is the beast took over. And that beast is going to take over for over forever and ever for a long or for a long period of time. And, and the seed of that serpent will just go to battle with the seed of the woman. But one day the son of man, a seed of a woman will stand and will conquer the beast. Now implant these characters back in Daniel. We understand the son of man is who? It's Jesus. Who is he speaking to? 
the high priest, and what other individual is not been accounted for in the Daniel story here? That Daniel part? How about the beast that will stand before and be destroyed? So now not only has the beast taken over the kings, the beast is ruling the priests. The beast is in control here. The beast controls the temple. The beast controls the life and death of the Son of God. And it had to be that way because God went ahead and implemented that fact that the high priest is the one who has to put the, the Lamb of God to death, to, to, to death every year. It had to be that way. And you read this and you're like, you suddenly go back to Genesis 1. It's like, let's make God in our image. Well, we probably look like him. Oh, there's so much more to this. If you keep going, it says that he did something very specific to, to bring life back in Genesis chapter 1. How, what does he do to bring life into the man or mankind? He breathes life into this man. Guess what they would do in ancient cultures to these idols, these images that they would, they would build and create for themselves. They would come and they would have these giant rituals and they'd be this amazingly crazy, oftentimes very, very like inappropriate things would happen in front of these images, hoping to breathe life into this thing. Meanwhile, God goes, you don't need this thing. You are this thing. I've already brought life into you. You just have to rule it. And here we are, still in existing, still existing today. Would you say the beast seemingly has control of this world? Just a little tiny bit. And we're given pictures like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. I don't know why we call Daniel by his Hebrew name and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego by their whatever. Belteshazzar, there you go. It's way more fun to say anyways. Esther. Yeah. Why? Because the Son of Man, who just so happens, by the way, this is just a fun one just to end on here, just so happens to come. Do you remember what they called him? The writer of the, he came in, in the clouds, right? You'll never guess. Baal, what, what is he the god of? <laughs> He's the writer of the clouds. <laughs> Baal is going to be called the writer of the clouds. Meanwhile, Jesus is like, no, 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 you don't even know. <laughs> like, I'm the writer of the clouds. And then how does he go up into heaven according to in his ascension in Acts chapter 1? While they're standing there talking to him, what happens? <laughs> what? Can you see, like, this is so, like, from page one to the end. It's like God had all of this figured out well before any of us could figure it out. And we'll read these little things, and if we're, care- if we're not careful, we glaze over. Or we ascribe potential, not real, inappro- inappropriate meaning to things like image and idol. Meanwhile, it's been given to us, and it, nothing has changed. What was true for Cain is still true for us if we choose to do well, we'll be elevated, we'll be lifted up, we'll be fine. But if not, be- sin is crouching like a beast. Its desire is to, what, what does it say about the lion, it, about Satan? He wants to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But it doesn't mean we have to. We can take these models that have been given to us in Daniel and Esther and all of these different people, and we can go, yeah, I mean, we don't have to, we don't have to let the beast rule us. We can still live by the authority of a king that truly rules this world. And then what, is, what does Peter call us? We are a, a royal nation set apart. We are a nation of priests. That was that verse from camp that was on our shirt. Yes, right. We are a royal nation. We are kings and priests. But Jesus isn't just any priest. He's a priest of, of the order of Melchizedek. Anybody here? We'll end with this. This is a fun one. Why, why Melchizedek? Why? Who were the priests? What tribe were the priests out of? Levites. The Levites. So why is Jesus not of the Levitical tribe? He is of the tribe of Judah. Why not the Levites? Why of the order of Melchizedek? Yep, yep. We're, getting, we're given like one passage in Old Testament, and a, a, he's in the cloud of witnesses. Cloud of witnesses in Hebrew in the he- in Hebrews. Well, he was good at the tribe. Hmm? He was good at the tribe. 
Yeah, he was given a tithe. Yeah, we're really not told much about anything, but we just know he's a priest of Yahweh. Pre, pre who, though? Well, pre-Christ and pre the Levites. The 12 tribes weren't established yet. This is in Genesis. And so Melchizedek is the original, like, priest. So Jesus doesn't come out of the Levites. He comes out of the one that were both Gentile and Israel. He's of the order that, that is for all, for Egypt, for Assyria, for, for Babylon. The Levites would be specific to Israel. And now you go, oh, 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 oh that little guy, he just thought he's, he says a name, one name that we read right over because he gave a tithe. And he's going, no, 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 I'm of the priesthood that's way bigger than Israel. Oh, I'm of all of the priesthood, the priesthood of the order of Melchizedek. All right, for the last couple of minutes, we'll just open up for questions if you have any clarifications or thoughts. We read like two verses in Genesis. That... <laughs> Nah. Nah. Yeah, you did. You read more this morning. Well, no, you didn't read more. This <laughs> it was a trick. It was a trap. So uh, where does Baal or whatever, where did that come from? Uh, quit trying to bait me into Genesis 6. <laughs> Imagination. <laughs> we'll get there. But when you read these kind of things and you see that these are the type of cultures that they exist in, then when you see... Like, for instance, later on in the Bible, when they go to the temple of Dagon, if you remember that story, they keep freaking out, right? Because they keep coming out and they put, they put the, was it the Ark? I think it was the Ark. Ark of Heaven. They put something of God's, I think it was the Ark, into the temple. And this idol of Dagon keeps falling over. It's like it's trying to escape. This little piece of rock is like trying to escape the, the presence of God. And it's, it's funny. It's, it's absolutely hilarious. In chapter 2, he says, oh, God... Bless God, he's pleasing God, God, God. And then in verse 4, it starts using Lord God. Mm. Lord, all create, all capital. Mm. So why are we saying that? So number one, if you read Genesis chapter 1, not as necessarily a literal account of creation, but a polemical account of creation. In other words, the writers are making a theological statement that would resonate to all of these ancient cultures that surround them. They're using pieces and parts and structures of all of their creation events, and they're saying Elohim, Elohim, Elohim. Well, now we're going to get to mankind, and mankind is going to look different in creation. And not only did Elohim, this plural basic term for a deity, is really... That's a better, like if I were to say in the beginning, deity created would probably resonate a little bit more. We obviously know that's God, but Elohim is a, just a generalized name for, it's a plural generalized name for deity, ultimately. So in the beginning, deity, but now we're going to get into the second part of creation, which we can probably jump into the next time. We'll get into the garden, right? He's going to start a new creative act, and he's going to develop ultimately what these two look like in creation specifically towards the man and the woman, not just mankind. And here, deity is given a little bit more of a title, a title specific that will separate and segregate from these, from these other ancient cultures. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's, that's what's unfolding, because what, what's unfolding is we're, di we're rediscovering after the exile the personal, personalized God. And so by the time you get to Moses, who's out in the wilderness trying to figure out whether he's Israelite or Egyptian, well, he's going to discover the personal name of this personal God. And that's where they will begin to tie their relationship together as far as Israel and Yahweh, the Lord God, over all of the Egyptian gods and, and all that. That's good. That's a good question. Quit trying to jump ahead. No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. Anything else? Mm. I thought the Ark of the Covenant came after the Israelites left Egypt. Yes. And, but we know they made sacrifices before then because you had Abraham that did Isaac, and then you had Cain and Abel that one was. Yes. And so they didn't have a temple and they didn't have mm -hmm. priests, but they still. Yeah. yeah, so this question begins immediately with Cain and Abel because how did they even know what to offer? Like, well, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, even to offer, right? 
that c- it continues on towards Noah when he gets off the boat. He brings clean animals. He offers clean animals, just like Leviticus would actually um, have him do it. He does it in the same manner. You're left questioning, like, well, how did he know that, you know? And you have to fill in blanks. Now, if you are a textual critic, which is a, 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 it's a profession in biblical scholarship that has to do with, like, well, they have this idea. It's called the document hypothesis, and what it is is they believe they've com- that all of Scripture was compiled together from ultimately like three basic sources that seem to be circulating all throughout Moses' time specifically. And what it is, it's this priestly source, which anything that you get with sacrifices where you're going, well, how did Noah know how to do that? They would ascribe that section to a priestly source who later on would retelling the story of Noah added in like, oh, and he was also sacrificing clean animals and then gathering all that together. I don't buy the document hypothesis deal. The question or the, 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 the question remains, and I think the best way to understand that is to interpret it through scripture itself. And that is that God was still present and still guiding personally at this, at this point. And at some point, what you're watching is it, what feels like a distancing from God. Right In Adam and Eve, we get him strolling in the cool of the morning with, with Adam and Eve. By the time you get to Noah, he's speaking to Noah in dreams. By the time you get to Moses, he's speaking to Moses through a burning bush. Right, He's no longer like necessarily a personal presence. And you have the angel of the Lord makes its appearance at different points, different ways. But it seems as if there seems to be a distancing physically from mankind and the voice of God. And so you, you're led to believe that God is still there in Noah's time and guiding him in practices and, and, and ways that aren't written down or given to us necessarily. So, but that's all speculation. That makes sense? That was way too much than you probably wanted to know. Just because like, it made me think, you know. Yeah. Because we have the how to do it. Yeah. You know, to build it. And so we know God told him to do it, but he hadn't told him yep. to do it before that. But when... <laughs> Yeah, yep. And you get the first experience of shed blood to cover up man's shame in the garden um, before pre-leaving the garden. That's the first time that God would physically do something to cover the result of a sin. And so you can fill in blanks there as well as far as like they've learned from that experience as well. But that's good, yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Okay. Well, we're after seven, so let me pray. And if you guys have questions you want to stay behind, let me know. Father God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for just continuing to reveal to us what it means to be human, what it means to exist here. Father God, I I know that those truths are still true to us today, that we are offered the same opportunity to rule the beast. God, and this is not of any of our own works or any of our own abilities, but God, it is to reflect the God who, uh, who does rule the beast who creates the beast, who, who plays with the beast. Father, we know that is you, and we know that you took care of that for us, and you, you bridged that gap, both the gap of, of a deified God and a human being, and you, you did that through Jesus, and we're thankful for that. God, I pray that we'll just continue to be aware of the ways of this world and that lead to destruction, and I pray that we, we don't add to that, but that we will be just beacons of light within this world that you hold the authority over. You've empowered us. You've, you've breathed life into us, both physical life and that of the Holy Spirit. And we, we know that that empowers us to do the things that seem impossible. I pray that every day in, in John's words, every day we decrease and you increase. Father, we love you and we thank you in your name. Amen.